the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve Him as His dear children. But we have disobeyed Him and deserve only His wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to Him and plead for His mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, He has removed your guilt forever. You are His own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to His will. Amen. Let us pray. O God, You rule over all things in wisdom and kindness. Take away everything that may be harmful and give us whatever is good. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. First reading for the second Sunday after Pentecost is recorded in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 11, beginning with verse 18. In society today, we see people be questioning uh, those in leadership, whether uh, in law enforcement or government or in the health profession, um, because the advice that they give us, the policies that they set, certainly have a, a great impact on our, on our life and our health, and we want to be sure that they are truly doing what is best for us. Reminded in our readings that as important as those things are, it's even more important to be sure that what our life is founded on when it comes to spiritual and eternal matters is truly the Word of God. Uh, it's only the Word of God which leads us closer to our Savior. And so we want to watch out for those who, even in the name of Christ, may be bringing us a message that is in conflict with the Bible to be sure that we are standing firm on God's Word. We read from Deuteronomy chapter 11. Imprint these words of mine on your hearts and minds. Bind them as a sign on your hands and let them be a symbol on your foreheads. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates so that as long as the heavens are above the earth, your days and those of your children may be many in the land the Lord swore to give your fathers. Look, today I set before you a blessing and a curse. There will be a blessing if you obey the commands of the Lord your God I am giving you today. And a curse if you do not obey the commands of the Lord your God and you turn aside from the path I command you today by following other gods you have not known. This is the word of the Lord. Psalm of the day is Psalm 78. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. O my people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will utter things from of old, what we have heard and what our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord. The Lord decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel so the next generation would know them and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget His deeds but would keep His commands. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Our second reading is recorded in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 3, beginning with verse 21. But now, apart from the law, 
the righteousness of God has been revealed, attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented Him as an atoning sacrifice in His blood, received through faith to demonstrate His righteousness. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By one of works? No, on the contrary, by a law of faith. For we conclude that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Alleluia. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Alleluia. Gospel is recorded in Matthew chapter 7 beginning with verse 15. Be on your guard against false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So you'll recognize them by their fruit. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. Therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded that house. Yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded that house, and it collapsed. It collapsed with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, because he was teaching them like one who had authority and not like their scribes. This is the gospel of our Lord. We make confession of our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We have God for our meditation. It's our second lesson recorded in Romans chapter 3. And here in those verses, the Apostle Paul really sets before us uh, the very heart and core of the Christian faith. He reminds us one of our natural spiritual condition. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But he also then reveals the solution. We are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. The doctrine of justification is the doctrine on which the Christian church stands or falls. God is in Christ Jesus our Savior has declared us not guilty, righteous in His sight. That is truly good news which comforts us in every situation and which then motivates us in our every action. That's the heart and core of the Bible's message. The Bible is not chiefly a rule book. Uh, its main message is not one of law, how we must live or of things that we must do to, to get to heaven. The Bible's main message tells us what God has done. It's gospel, it's good news of how God in Jesus has rescued the world from sin and damnation. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All are justified freely by His grace. And so we can take comfort in God's righteousness. But Paul pictures for us a courtroom, God's courtroom. The accused called to stand before the judge is all mankind, you and me included. But even with billions of people, no one can hide. Each are counted one individual after another, one at a time, each is charged with sin. The violation of God's perfect will and law. And what can we say? Because we might want to make excuses, but the law doesn't leave any room to, to, to wriggle free or to make excuses. Now picture the, the child who's about to be punished by his parents. But he didn't know, but I, I didn't mean to, but he did it too. But it wasn't my fault. All the excuses, all the attempts to justify that wrong action, the law silences those excuses. The law shows us clearly that we are guilty. shows that we deserve punishment. No ifs, no buts. We cannot do what is right before God. We cannot do what He requires. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are subject to the law, so that every mouth may be shut and the whole world may be subject to God's judgment. For no one will be justified in his sight by the works of the law, because the knowledge of sin comes through the law. The law serves as a mirror to show us our sin, to show us our desperate need for a Savior. The law silences our, our excuses. It crushes our pride. And everyone is in the same situation. Sinful and deserving God's just punishment. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But aren't we tempted to think, that's not fair. What about that kind individual who unselfishly helps others in need? 
What about that person who is always willing to lend a helping hand, who never has a negative word to say about anyone? What about that person who would give you the shirt off his back if, he ne if you needed it? What about me? I'm certainly not as bad as some. I, I'm not perfect, but I try to do what is right. I struggle. After all, I've never committed adultery with anyone. I've never murdered anyone. I don't steal. and In fact, I'm actually a pretty good person. I go to church. I help others. But don't we often find it easy to, to see the faults of others and then to overlook our sins? How often don't we like to think that we aren't that bad and then to, to downplay our sins? So how can good people, how can I be lumped together with you know, that monster who, who killed his own family or with the, the pedophile who abused all those children or the, the crook who destroyed so many lives with his fraud and deception? Now surely God, the just judge of all the earth, will make some allowance for such good people, some allowance for me. But listen again. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And God doesn't need any evidence from us. He knows it all already. The worst of us stand covered with shame and the, the best of us can make no boast. We still have sinned. In fact, to really examine what the law says and what it demands... We realize before God, we are not good. We're worthless, miserable sinners. The law says lust is the same as adultery. It tells us hatred is murder. It says that coveting after what is not ours, failing to be content with what we have, those are sins just as damning as stealing. To look into the mirror of God's perfect law, I see that I am nothing but a terrible, miserable sinner who deserves God's punishment and damnation. Doesn't matter how far short you've fallen, no person measures up to God's glory. No person is able to be perfect as He demands. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all bear that same title, that terrible title of sinner, and all deserve same punishment, ultimately hell forever. But it's a good thing that we're all lumped together, deserving the same punishment, because if there was a distinction, where would that line be drawn? How good would be good enough? How could I ever be sure that I was good enough? Because the bottom line is there never was a time when I lived up to the demand of the, the judge's law to love God with all my heart and all my soul and all my might and all my strength. And that I love my neighbor always as much as I love myself. But just as it's the case that everyone is a sinner who falls short of God's glory, it's also the case that everyone is saved in the same way. Salvation is a free gift of a gracious God. We do nothing for it. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how rich you are, what status you have, or what you've done, how good of a person you are in the eyes of the world. All are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. By faith in Christ Jesus, I am forgiven. God's righteousness is my own, not by works, but by faith alone. The Apostle Paul writes to the Ephesians, It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now God reveals Himself as a merciful and gracious and loving God. But He is also holy and just God. So God can't just forgive by ignoring or overlooking sins. He's rightly angry with sin and with sinners. 
God says, the soul who sins is the one who will die. In our society, even in some churches, people don't want to talk about God's anger over sin. They want to forget that God is a God of justice. But such a God that many want is not the God revealed in the Bible. Such a God who is not faithful to all His word, who can't be counted on to keep His promises, that's not the God of the God Bible. God is very serious about His promises, including the, the promises, the threats that He makes in His law. God requires that every sin be punished. And any religion then or doctrine that teaches that God forgives without proper payment attacks God's justice. And so a price had to be paid to make the peace. That price was very costly. That price was the suffering and innocent, in, innocent death of God's own Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus had to shed His blood on the cross to set us free so that God might be just and forgiving. Jesus, God's own Son, suffered the punishment for the sins of the whole world. The writer to the Hebrews tells us that in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. God requires that every sin be punished. And there, on the cross in Jesus, He punished every sin. There on the cross, God showed His perfect judgment, justice. And it may at times appear as though God overlooks sin. We may be tempted at times to think that maybe some sin really isn't that serious a thing. But it is, and there on the cross we see how serious it is. God's own Son had to suffer and die. But through Jesus' sacrifice, we are now at one. We are at peace with God. Like later in Romans, in chapter 6, Paul writes, Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? And he writes to the Corinthians, we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. So when God says every sinner shall die, we look to the cross and say every sinner did die. There on the cross, law and gospel, God's justice and God's love are brought into perfect harmony. Thus our salvation was very costly, but for us, it cost nothing. For us, it's given as a, a free gift of God's grace. We don't have to do any work to get it. Nothing that we do counts towards it. It's a gift. You don't do anything for a gift. By faith, God credits us with Jesus' righteousness. And clothed with Jesus' righteousness, God's judgment then is not guilty. You're free. Free from sin, free to spend eternity in the glories of heaven. How that affects our life now, what a wonderful gift we received. It's a gift that's received by faith, but even that faith isn't something that we can take credit for. Now, faith is not some good work, some requirement that we have to meet to be saved. And the message of the gospel finally is not something that we would figure out on our own, but God has to reveal it to us in His Word. He did that already in the Old Testament as He pointed ahead to that coming Savior. And faith then is the hand that receives those blessings of Jesus' sacrifice, that trusts in what Jesus has done. That faith has worked through the Word. And since faith is confidence in what someone else has already done, it isn't to any credit to the person who trusts and believes. And so as Paul says, there's no reason for us to boast in ourselves. Faith is not the cause of God's verdict. Now God's declaration stands. We have been justified. Jesus' work is done. Now unbelief rejects and tosses away those blessings which have been purchased by Jesus' sacrifice. But the motive, the, the reason and cause for our salvation lies entirely with God and His grace because of His undeserved love for us sinners. 
The method then to accomplish our justification was the price paid by Jesus on the cross. And it's received then by us by faith. So that all glory, all credit for our salvation belongs to God. And what a wonderful thing that is. Because it rests with God, we can be sure of our salvation. Never have to worry if I've done enough. No, faith rests on God's objective declaration of forgiveness based on Christ's atoning work. Since God in Christ has declared the world not guilty, I can be sure of my forgiveness. And so the believer should never look inside of himself for assurance of salvation. He can't find comfort and consolation in his own life of good works. He can't find comfort in his own fickle feelings that change from one moment to the next. He isn't to look to his own prayers and his spiritual wrestling for the assurance of salvation. Not to find comfort in his faith. In other words, he's not to have faith in faith. And to look inside of ourselves as sinners, only find sin and death from which we can't free ourselves. Instead, the Christian directs his gaze to the cross, to the promises of God that are fulfilled there. And in that way, the, the confidence of the Christian is built on the unshakable foundation of the already completed righteousness of Jesus. A righteousness that is outside the sinful hearts of men, that's grasped through faith, that confidence is found in the suffering and death of Christ. And there, believers find security and peace. Now, the objective reality of justification for the world that was accomplished at the cross does not change with our feelings and emotions. It remains rock solid. It remains unshakable. God's complete forgiveness purchased at Calvary and assured by Easter's empty tomb that is the objective comfort for troubled sinners. So take comfort in God's righteousness. It's not a righteousness that God demands from you, but it's a righteousness that is yours in Christ. That God's righteousness is your own. You have been declared not guilty. Heaven is yours. Salvation is free simply by God's grace. That's the heart and core of the Bible. That's the heart and core of our faith. That blessed truth shapes and directs our lives and assures us of an eternity in glory. What a truly wonderful message that is. God's righteousness, a righteousness which we sinners need, is provided by Christ and received by faith. Amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Well, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier, we thank You for graciously promising to hear all who call upon You in truth. Hear our prayer as we ask especially for those things which are good for our spiritual welfare. Do not count our many sins against us, but wash us clean in Jesus' blood. Give us a vigorous faith which trusts only in Your mercy and grace. And let us never trust in our own merit and worthiness. Fill each of us with a longing for your word, that by reading it, studying it, and hearing it preached, we grow in our faith toward you, in our knowledge of the truth, and in our love for one another. Graciously impart to us the Savior's spirit of humility, and cast from our hearts all sinful pride and doubt. Capture our hearts with your love, that we may be faithful to you in every way and fruitful in every good work. Teach us to place all our burdens and cares on you through fervent and frequent prayer. And grant us faith to believe that when we ask of you, we shall receive. Help us count our blessings and to remember that every good gift comes from you. 
May our love for you be a ready and cheerful response to your great love for us. Then we will speak and sing your praises. When we are chastised, give us patience and strength to bear whatever you place upon us. Grant us grace to learn the spiritual lessons you desire to teach us. Cheered by the knowledge that in all things you work for the good of those who love you. Enable us to bear our lot in life without complaining. Give us strength to endure all trials to our faith and to overcome every temptation. Uphold us by your power that we never falter or fail in our allegiance to you, nor lose hold of our eternal life which you have prepared for us. That your kingdom of grace may be brought to the hearts of others. Give us a godly zeal to show forth your salvation from day to day and from place to place. May we never fear or be ashamed or hesitate to confess your name before the world. All these things we ask of you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in our Savior's name, Amen. And we join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Oh, see.